the importance of process and the constitution is a template for a process of how to hold the country together how to build a better future how to enshrine rights but before we get into the conversation i wanted to sort of introduce our guest here a speaker it's a privilege sir to have you here on the day he retired chief justice y v chandrachur described him in five words which sort of encompass everything that we expect out of the justice system he said justice call is a unique blend of wisdom and compassion and this is exactly what we expect from the judiciary and the justice system to me justice call sort of is different with a distinction some of the work that some of the judgments that he has given are very interesting and since we are a media platform i'll read that part first in 2008 he upheld the freedom of expression in the mf hussain case in 2016 the perumal murugan case the overreach by a state or extra activism by the state in opening the or filing the curative petition on the bhopal gas issue and most recently in a very considered view on the judgment on abrogation of article 370 where he stood out by asking for a truth and reconciliation commission we'll come to that issue in a bit but i think the first thing that the title of the session the constitution as the guiding light so ambedkar had said in the constituent assembly debates the constitution is a vehicle of life and its spirit is always the spirit of age when in 2024 when we look at the constitution as a guiding light there are a number of young people here how would you sort of present this idea to them i mean the constitution as a guiding light and the importance of the constitution being the centerpiece of our life good morning to everybody welcome uh see the best of the brains of this country who had dedicated themselves to the freedom movement decided to sit together to draft the constitution we borrowed from different constitutions uh we made the amalgam as one of the most fabulously written constitution and it was said that uh if something goes wrong it's not wrong with the constitution it's the way we the people work it because a man was wild or man would uh, be wild yes. yeah. so uh, th- that was the issue when we talk about the constitution as the sentinel on equivi as the supreme court says the idea is the guiding spirit so if there are conflicts if there are differences in thought processes you must get back to the parent document to see how does it read and that's what the court's job is the court's job is to read the constitution reread it when political dispensations or other dispensations don't play ball if i may say so to tell them what restricts them because the constitution takes place a balancing factor between the executive the judiciary and the the political dispensations and the check and balance is provided by the judicial system so how that system will work will uh, depend on uh, how much and in what manner the court keeps on informing the executive when the issue arises that what is permissible and what is not permissible look at the fundamental rights chapters look at the directive principles chapters look at women empowerment issues the whole spectrum is there it's not a lack of spectrum 
it has faced many amendments because as, as society develops, there have been amendments to it, some uh, uh, arising from the uh, political thought processes which come into it. But uh, it still remains the fundamental book, if one may say so, to look to when in doubt and say, did the creators of this constitution, did the creators of an independent country, and I, I always believe, keep reminding that, please look around and see, uh, we are fortunate in some way, we are critical also about our system, but we are fortunate in some way, we still have a, a form of democracy which is different from around the countries if you see around. Thank you, sir. That's an important validation that when we look around our geography and countries around the world, the fact that we have sustained a democracy for 75 years uh, deserves an applause and all of you sitting behind should uh, applaud the fact that India has a functioning, vibrant democracy. Justice Kaul, you also mentioned in some, uh, one of your speeches, one of your talks, that the judiciary is not the moral conscience keeper of politics, that the courts would deal with aspects of law and aspects of politics must be dealt with in the realm of politics. But there is an intersection here where we tend to think in India, and still the state is a very large part of our being, whether how politicians behave or how politics is conducted, when people are frustrated, angry, anxious, they come to the court. How does this bridge get created? So, uh, if I may correct, I did not say the court is not the constitution keeper of the court or the moral keeper of the court. You said there that is, it's a conscience keeper of the constitution, yeah. sorry. So, yeah. there, is a, there is a distinction between what the court is required to determine and what the political sphere is required to determine. Uh, what happens at time is that uh, where there is, a, I would say, disparity in the strength of the political groupings which are there, what happens is the expectation is the court should intervene to uh, look to their side. Well, the court's job is to see that any government adheres to the constitution. Sometimes there are uh, coalition governments which are not so strong. There may be single party rules as we see today and we've seen it in the past where the governments are strong. To that extent, the court roles becomes a little more uh, active in ensuring that the fundamentals of the constitution are in place. But it cannot be, what I said is a substitute for the political arena issues which need to be addressed in the political arena al alone. That's what I was seeking to emphasize, that we have under this uh, often public interest litigation or some connected matters, uh, a thought process which was developed to help the underprivileged of the society. That should not be utilized uh, to settle the political issues which are there. If there's a legal political issue, Suppose there's an interpretation of it. We've seen this in interplay of, of the state's role and the role of the central government. The court will certainly step in to um, uh, take a call and, uh, and decide what should be the role which each of them should perform. So that's the distinction I'm seeking to carve out, that the political, political issues should be settled in the political domain. The political, legal issues can be determined in the courts. So if I may sort of try and interpret this a little better is that if the point is that the court cannot be expected to play the role of the opposition in a system exactly. where the domination is greater. But and you also spoke about empowering all parts of society to nurture this uh, project which is the project of uh, nurturing the constitution. In our system, we always find rights of the oppressed, the deprived, the minorities, uh, the sexual minorities, all, all of them. The domination of one grouping sort of pushes them to the edge and they come to the court through PILs, the public interest litigation and others. 
Similarly, political groupings who find themselves pushed to the margin by uh, a wave of uh, support to the other side, they tend to come and look for you, uh, look to the courts to sort of step in and, uh, you know, maybe extend. Now, the point that you make that the court can't be expected to play the role of the opposition in any system, but people expect change, people expect redressal. So, if you were to go, we were to go back to this very important point that you made that we must empower, empower all parts of society. This is a huge project. How does this get done? What is the, does the legal education system, does our education system promote this thought in, in, in our, uh, across our society? Is there enough debate about these issues? So let me say this, uh, something which has troubled me, and I have spoken more than once, is that we are a very diverse country. There will be difference of ideas, there will be difference of perceptions. And the willingness to accept the different perceptions and carry on is very important. Some way I find the, the, the dialogue becoming less, uh, more acrobatic in, in its terms. And uh, uh, the ability to, for, uh, you know, uh, to carry people along is under challenge. Uh, it can't be a my way or highway principle uh, in this scenario, in a country like ours. So that's the challenge which arises, and the court is required to intervene and support certainly the marginalized sections. There may be different me methods of those minorities. So I'm not saying those people will not come to court. It may be, uh, you've seen the recent past, many issues have cropped up. Uh, Last example was this, the same-sex marriage issue. Well, there are social issues which need to be debated and sometimes socially acceptable, sometimes it is taking time. So I always give the example of, of that, that case as a journey. Journey in the sense many years back when uh, decriminalization had to take place. Uh, I, I was fortunately or unfortunately part of just to join the bench when this matter came up. And uh, I, I told my senior judge that we must issue notice and examine this. Uh, I tried to be a little more adventurous to see that it must be decided now, which I was told you are still young in the judiciary, you know, just wait, there are some things which take time to work it out. Uh, it went through a journey of, of uh, being dismissed, going to Supreme Court, remitted back, debate taking place, and ultimately the High Court ruling in one way, the Supreme Court in another way. Finally, uh, those people got what they thought was due to them. So the social churning also takes time at times, and so does the judicial churning uh, takes time. I, I certainly feel that um, the, uh, the, the sections of the society, the fact that you are in a minority grouping in any form, uh, certainly you are entitled to an equal treatment and the constitution steps in. And we as judges are required to step in to ensure that uh, those sections are able to lead their life within the domain of the constitution without any interruption. So, this is called one of the things that, I mean, if I step away a little bit from the philosophical underpinnings of the constitution and the uh, issues, there is a sense that sometimes judges in one level make a decision, then it gets overturned in another, or cases are sent back, and the government seems to think that this reflects on the quality of the judges that are in the system. You had on your retirement sort of mentioned this in one of the interviews that probably the, the way we bring in appoint judges, the way the collegium system works, and you made a very important point that the NJAC, the National Judicial uh, Appointments Commission, could have been made to work, that it could have been tweaked. I had two points to it. Do you think that the NJAC would have been a better system than the current collegium system? And a more important question is, does the current collegium system affect the merit of the judges that are appointed or is there, uh, I am kind of, 
being very careful with using the word that certain interests or certain interested people's uh, appointments carry through uh, what uh, within the judiciary is called the uncle's phenomena. Uh, is the quality of judges that we have, I'm not even talking about the subordinate judiciary where things need to improve really, but in the higher judiciary, is the collegium system a barrier or a hurdle to appointment of quality judges? So let's see how, how originally the appointment system began. The constitution had a particular system. We continued with it till early 1990s. And then um, it was felt that some changes were required and the collegium system was defined. It worked well for many years, there's no doubt about it. But uh, somewhere down the line, I felt there were challenges uh, which are, arose because the, the political system felt that the constitution <coughs> devises a method by which the political dispensation has a say in it and it should not be exclusively judges appointing judges. The fact is even in the, in the collegium system, there is an interaction which takes place in as much as the opinions, uh, the system works in a manner where judges are recommended by a collegium, it travels to the executive, opinions are taken, state opinions, central opinions, goes to the Collegium of the Supreme Court, then the appointments take place. So it's not that uh, the consultative processes were not there, they were there. And, uh, but my question was that uh, ultimately the parliament enacted the NJC. It got quashed when I say in retrospect that it could have worked was that there, it constituted a committee of six judges, uh, six uh, persons, out of which three were judges. So feeling was that predominance of the judiciary would be affected um, that the manner of working may create a deadlock and that's why it was struck down because before that the Venkatchalaya committee also looked into it. Possibly a five member uh, committee could have worked. The political dispensation talked about a six member committee. My view was if the Chief Justice had possibly been granted the casting vote it could have worked. This is arising from the fact that the appointment process is too slow. Uh, it takes too much of time and uh, which is causing a grave concern because it is becoming difficult to persuade the legal fraternity or the bright minds to accept position on the bench. I think that's the challenge which I'm concerned about. Uh, and it's, it's not the, uh, as it's said, I'll say openly, the uncle syndrome working. I think uh, I have personally tapped a number of uh, first generation lawyers from national law schools trying to personally persuade them. I felt as a judge it was my job to persuade a good talent to come onto the bench. Most of them are unwilling uh, and one of the reasons is uh, maybe one reason could be monetary but more than that they say that it takes too much of time and, and what is the guarantee that if we are willing to make the sacrifice ultimately this matures into an appointment. So what is happening is uh, I feel a backroom dialogue takes place. The collegium system would have at least people sit across the table and debate out and tell them why certain appointments must be made sorry, or why so certain appointments can't be. Sorry to uh, interrupt, just for our audience to understand. The process involves no face-to-face -face engagement between the judiciary and the executive. No. And would problem. that be a good idea to have a kind of face-to-face -face yes, -face engagement? Uh, yes, because what happens is the, the file moves, you make notings on the file, comes here, then again goes back. And yet I do believe informally uh, discussions do take place. So why not have it formally, those discussions? Uh, so that we, uh, we have a more open system in it, in the appointment process. And an open system, I don't mean we sit like this in a public debate and debate whether a person has to be appointed a judge or not. The only idea is it's a more system-oriented process which the appointment can take place. I, I may even say that we are wiser after the event uh, because uh, I, I'm sure the people who set it aside at that time thought that uh, uh, the continuing system would be better, though at least I'm aware two of the judges out of the five later on said that it was possibly a mistake. So that's, that's the basis on which I made the comment that we must encourage the best of talent to come. The national law schools are producing some of the brightest minds today. Those uh, law schools, national, we have Sastra here, so many of them have produced students. Why should not their products come onto the bench? Why this hesitation to come onto the bench? I, I believe the process is not very conducive uh, to getting uh, the best of the talent. I think first generation uh, lawyers have increased, first generation judges have increased. So I don't think that should be a concern. Uh, really. So the merit 
or the quality of judges that we have may improve. But sir, this brings us to the question, I mean, there is this whole Latin thing, law abhors delay, and we have an incredible system about 20 years back, we were talking about two crore cases pending. Now we have five crore cases pending. Isn't that something that sort of affects the promise of one of the three promises in the constitution? And when we say the constitution is our guiding light, I mean, if we, how do we promise equality uh, without delivering on justice? So that's, I think, the greatest challenge today. To be able to administer justice within time is, I, I think, a problem we have to face. Now, uh, not as a qualification, but let me say, when we talk about so many crore cases, in a population of so many crores, there will bound to be issues which will come up before the court. The case, the date is filed, doesn't become a, a pendency. So if the case is not decided within a stipulated period of time, is the problem. Many cases, many, many cases get decided within time, but often that does not make news. But the cases which are pending for years together, naturally there's a problem. So the, we have to devise and think out of the box how to get the cases which are stuck in the system uh, out of it. There are priorities given to older cases, etc. I have been a strong believer in propagating um, mediation and other alternative methods, and not only because they will help in reducing the the backlog in court, but also sometimes there are better solutions to a problem because it is, it is uh, something which occurs across the table with the litigants uh, deciding in a sense what they want. Uh, it's not the, that on a basic principle of law the judge imposes on it without them knowing why they got a particular thing and did not get something else. So uh, we, the American system adopted mediation in 80s, they were early 80s, they were in a similar problem. Today less than 3% cases go to trial there. If we expect every case to go to trial, if we expect each case to go through multiple tiers of scrutiny, then I'm afraid this problem is not going to get solved. So we have to think how to make it run uh, in, in a little different kind of a manner and find solutions to it. The litigant is interested. See, you're talking about technology. I was seeing the, the, the previous uh, uh, dialogue. And uh, in an age where everything happens with technology and in future, we can't expect people to wait for years together. That is something which is a concern. I, I just wanted to highlight one point, sir. I mean, this, we must be the only country in the world where the government litigates against its own uh, orders, I mean, income tax and other. The government is one of the biggest litigators in the country. That, I don't know how uh, that persists. There must be some filter system that should be there. And the second more important point, I mean, I remember uh, in his closing remarks on the finalizing of the constitution, uh, Dr. Ambedkar had said that uh, people uh, may get tired or he said that new ideologies, new problems will create, will come up in such a way that people will get tired of the idea of a government of the people, by the people, and they just opt for a government for the people, which may be authoritarian, totalitarian, however. Isn't that a threat to the very idea of our democracy? I mean, that, that when you don't deliver uh, justice in time, the frustrations might go through. And we've seen this play out in our neighborhood. No, certainly uh, when you talk about uh, an expeditious decision of cases, that's, that's a priority and must be done. Yes, I, I, I always say I don't know any, I don't know really of a country where government is more than 50% litigant. So let's go to England and see how many uh, litigations would there be again by, us, by or against the city civil borough or something like that. Here uh, you have to sit, couple of judges sit on every municipal jurisdiction, civic jurisdictions, service jurisdictions. Huge amount of litigation is uh, persons working for the government litigating with the government. So a, di a higher level of dissatisfaction. Now. Uh, the government must lessen the litigations. There is no doubt about it, I've been saying. Otherwise... Uh, Sir, they are not even willing to reveal the number of cases filed by the judges. There are ministries who have refused to file in that system that they've created now for government litigation. So if an endeavor is made, we did make some endeavors to see how to reduce it. But there is a reluctance to accept a view also. So if the same issue is decided, in multiple cases, the same issue will keep on cropping up again and again. 
I think no officer wants to take a responsibility. Uh, they feel they may be, and they have a reason, they feel that couple of years down the line, they may be in a problem. So you must have a system by which, say, a committee or something, we can judge with, whether once this one issue is decided, whether other cases should keep on cropping up. Even that was experimented judicially, I remember setting up, uh, requesting, say, the National Highway Authority set up a committee of, of the technical people and the judges, so that unnecessarily tiers of scrutiny don't come up. I think we have to ultimately list, restrict how many tiers of scrutiny will the case go through. If there was a court above the Supreme Court, I'm sure many judgments of the Supreme Court would also be set aside. So, but uh, we do believe in this country there is a court above the court. Supreme court. I, it's just the final court, so the decision is final, that's all. It's not that we are perfect or anybody is perfect, that uh, it's an opinion. Ultimately, what is it? We are an opinion. Uh, somebody else may have an opinion tomorrow, that opinion may change. It happens in public domain also, so it happens in courts also. Sir, I have two points uh, to sort of. One is the mention that you made about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that should be appointed. Do for particularly for Kashmiris who were chased out of their homes. Uh, is that? Do you think it's a possibility? Do you think it will happen? That or as you said, sometimes it takes time for society to accept certain things. So to accept. Uh, and I'm aware, I'm mean, acutely aware of this conversation, a similar conversation happening in North America and in other places which promoted the idea of slavery for a long time and now there is a greater demand there for again repatri uh, reconciliation, in even compensation they're talking about. But is this a possibility in, in a condition where we are not yet sure, we are uncertain what, how things will play out in the geopolitical arena in Kashmir. Can people return with dignity to uh, Kashmir? So there are parts of this question. I mean, whether the government will do it or not, um, I can't be a soothsayer, I can't say they will do it. I have written because I hope that they will do so. Let's see what is the solution, you know. We faced 1984, the problem in 1984. Till today, battles are going on on that. The issue was that if you are saying today evidence is not available, other things are not available, proving cases in court is a challenge. The point is somebody must acknowledge that from a part of the country, four and a half lakhs people almost overnight were uh, compelled to leave. They have a pain, they have an anguish. They may have settled in these 30 years in different parts of the country and different parts of the world. But somebody must acknowledge that something has gone wrong. That itself is a reparation in a sense. Non-acknowledgement continues to, uh, the anguish continues with that. Now, after that, you had, the, you had the armed services moving in, trying to fight a battle. People who stayed back have their own story to tell. At least have the stories told so that people try to put uh, uh, an, an end to that issue. Uh, Post-partition, it took many, many years for it to settle down. Similarly here, if 30 more years have gone by, this is the only method. That's what I believe. Whether those people will come back to their home in Hath, well, I'm, I'm doubtful that everybody is going to come back. That's not how it will occur. But, you know, people migrate. People voluntarily migrate from villages to, to cities for job and other reasons. I, I, if, if the person who went away in a small place where he stayed, if he is able to even come back in security and spend time there, I think that's the solution to the problem. It's not that suddenly one fine day, uh, the the uh, reparation will take place and all those people who left 30 years and the next generation which is coming is going to come back. But it will help them connect to the roots. I, I, I know of people who miss that uh, connection, that they are not able to get back to the roots. Uh, that's the challenge, I think. No, uh, sir, my question was a little more wider in the sense that we speak about the individuals making a choice or the families making a choice. Is this situation conducive enough? Will the government do it? Because one point that has been made on this is that an establishment of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission for Kashmir opens the door for Truth and Reconciliation com Commissions for, say, 1984, for other riots, for partition, for people uh, will, I mean, you know, arguably find other reasons of displacement. Well, if... if uh if this, I don't uh, recollect such kind of displacement taking place 
post partition from a specified area, hmm. uh, as has happened. It was a small minority of people, as it is the percentage of population was small. And that they should be in a scenario where they have been compelled to move overnight is a challenge. The purpose is for them to find some solace that there is an acknowledgement of what, is, what has gone wrong and help them reconnect their roots. That's the limited purpose for which it will subserve. I don't think it will open the Pandora's box. It's, it's, that's what your suggestion is. Sir, I want, this is my, la, I mean, I, we have run out of time, I think. I wanted to ask you, you made a mention or you remarked at one point that there is something that you would speak up about, but that you would speak about it after your retirement. And that mystery persists, so I was wondering if you would speak about that. And none of us knows, we don't know what it was actually on your mind that you wished to speak up about. What mystery? <laughs> <laughs> See, there are some things which happen in the system, I believe should not have happened or happened. Everything can't be in public domain. But uh, I only said that, uh, you know, the, the, it's a continuous endeavor to find a better and more transparent system. Uh, Sir, can I, can I just sort of, because the audience might be wondering what I am talking about. This was a very important case that you had heard and it came up for review and it was to be heard by your court and it turned out that you were not going to hear that case. So that uh, it's a, in a decided case and application, we are trying, we were trying to, well, if some people say yes, push the government to make appointments because that's what is required for them to do. Um, it was towards the end of my tenure, I had held it. Uh, the master of the roster principle comes in, the Chief Justice defines where the role was to go. In any case, they had to go somewhere else uh, after the end of December. So it, uh, it hopefully should go somewhere and appear. That's what my concern is. I, I really did not know why it happened, but uh, I leave it at that. So there is no more secret to that. We won't. No, no. Is, it, it's, it's, I, I'm hoping that this would be part of your memoirs or something. Uh, what uh, I will write and when I will write is an issue. I think something should be written <laughs> uh, much after the relevant time. Uh, it's better that way rather than uh, on, the, on the first finger at, at the relevant time. I guess justice is also a dish served best cold, I guess. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, Mr. Chawla has a question. Sorry, Justice Cole, because uh, this is a question as a journalist I'm asking, because Mr. Shankar here was indulging in economics, I'm indulging in reporting. Question is that there's a general perception that quality of judges has gone down substantially during the last 10 years. Quality of judges which are there is not happening because of selection process is bad. Do you agree that the quality of justice being appointed is more guided by caste, community, and relationship? No, the appointment process certainly has a, a many spectrum issues coming up now. There is a feeling that representations of different sections of society need it. The regional, we are a large country, the regional representation takes place. It was a smaller court earlier when you're talking about the Supreme Court or the High Court. Number of judges have expanded over a period of time. So representative characters has its own uh, challenges. But as I said, the greater challenge I feel is we must make sure and encourage the right kind of talent to come onto the bench and, and remove the hesitancy which some of them may have to come onto the bench. That's, that's my personal view that there is enough talent there, but it should be made conducive in a manner that they make the relevant sacrifice and come onto the bench. I guess Prabhu's question was that are bad judges being appointed? No, I, I, I think the check-in balances are too many. Yes, there is no perfect system. Uh, there may be pace cases which do not. I, I had a wonderful opportunity to appoint judges in Chennai. I, I, uh, out of the committee collegium I headed, we recommended 60 judges. 46 judges were appointed to this court. Some of them have performed wonderfully well. Some of them I thought could have done better. So this will always arise. It's a judgment call you take. There is no perfect way by which you know when you appoint somebody in your exec, you know, corporate domain, you really don't know how it will work out uh, five years down the line. The only thing is we have no method by suddenly saying now bye-bye, you know, you go out. Uh, 
uh, as you can do. I, I, I'll end up with that. The final question is that, do you, do you notice that government is defying the orders of the Supreme Court? Sometimes in your own judgment, you gave the orders to the government to come with some certain proposal, and they frequently defied your directives. Do you think it's a threat to judicial system itself? We, we must be, I, I, I'm strongly of the view, must be able to implement our orders. Either don't pass orders, if you pass orders, you must be able to get it done and implement it. Uh, we, we can't have a scenario where uh, um, a government of the day says that what is palatable is accepted and what is not, because we, we tend to rule both against and for the government. Both things arise. So um, that respect for the orders, I think, is a very important part of a, a judicial work. And, and the contempt jurisdiction is specifically conferred for that, to ensure we don't have a, the police behind us, we don't have an army behind us. So it's, it's the word of the judge, uh, the judge, judgment being accepted, which has to take place. And that must be enforced is certainly my unequivocal. But sir, in the order on the appointment of how the chief election commissioner has to be appointed, the structure was given by the Supreme Court, and the government simply legislated a story. So, well, one is that the structure was given in the absence of a law. It happens earlier in many scenarios where law is absent, the court creates this structure. But that is still the law is enacted. Okay. Now, so, therefore, it is not prohibited. Now, whether this particular manner of doing so in case of election commission, certainly I am sure this will come up before the court to consider whether the, the manner needed to be altered in this way in a legislation. Thank you very much, Justice Call. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this.